Well, Ken Lay is in his grave, although questions to the contrary persist. Uh, but I actually, as conspiracy theorist as I am, do not think there's any truth to that particular conspiracy. Um, Jeff Skilling is in prison, although his his uh, conviction is currently um, on appeal at the Supreme Court. And um, Andy Fasto is still in prison as well. <laughs> I would almost say that I wasn't cynical enough because if you had asked me back then if we were going to have another financial crisis, um, this one much bigger that makes Enron look like a canary in a coal mine or just the little hiccup before the big explosion, I would have said, oh, it, it can't possibly happen for a while. We've, we've learned some lessons, surely. And I would have been completely wrong. I have one child and another on the way, so I met my husband in the world's most surprising way. He was actually um, the prosecutor um, of, of, um, on the Enron team. He was the, the lead Enron prosecutor, and we were both divorced at the, the time we met, and lo and behold, um, strange, I guess people meet in all sorts of strange places, and life takes some very strange twists, because if you had asked me when I lived in New York and worked for Fortune if I would ever leave Fortune or ever leave New York, I would have said absolutely not. And here I am. You know, in, in a way it's not so different and I loved Fortune and I'm extraordinarily grateful to the magazine for the for the freedom I got when I was there. Vanity Fair is one of the few magazines that routinely runs very long investigative pieces, you know, seven, eight, nine thousand words and even Fortune only only rarely does that. Um, and so there, there's a little more freedom of, of subject matter at Vanity Fair, although right after I got there the, the financial crisis really hit in full force so I found myself doing just the same sort of stories I, I probably would have worked on at, at Fortune. But it was ma mainly for me, I'd spent 13 years at Fortune and my entire career as a journalist and, and that was all I knew. And I think it's, it's important to, you, you learn something about yourself by moving to a different place. Sometimes good things, sometimes bad things, usually both. But, but those are important lessons, I think. You know, just as our publisher came up with the title, The Smartest Guys in the Room, I have to give credit for this one to my publisher. They came up with the title, but it's actually a line from Shakespeare. Um, and uh, and uh, as soon as we heard it, my co-author and I both said, that's perfect. We started thinking about it in the fall as the financial crisis was hitting in full force, September 2008. My co-author, Joan Ostera, who was my editor at Fortune and then who edited me, uh, who edited The Smartest Guys in the Room, was in Chicago actually working on a column and we were sitting in my house and he said, we should do a book together about, about the financial crisis. At that point in time, we thought it was a unique original idea. We were soon um, disabused of that notion. But, um, uh, and I, I thought, I, I wasn't so sure about about embarking on another book. The last one was was a really difficult process, and I, I that was still too fresh in my mind. But I have the utmost respect for Joe and the ability to work with him again, plus uh, be able to spend you know a couple of years thinking about something that I was really interested in and delving into all these tales that otherwise I'd never really be able to delve into. I thought, okay, sign me up. <laughs> I think it is a really different book. I, I fully believe that you only have in you the bo one book, though, then you can't, you may tr think you should write a different book, but you, but you can't do that. And so from the very beginning, we wanted to tell the history of the financial crisis. We wanted to go back 20 years in time and talk about all the things, all the various strands that had to come together in order to create this. And they're, and they're very different strands and pull it together into, into a narrative. And we definitely had moments of second guessing that when, for example, Andrew Ross Sorkin's great book came out and you know it's just this wonderful blow by blow of the of the meltdown on Wall Street and you think oh sh should we should should we should we have done that and of course at that point you also think thank goodness we didn't we didn't do that but um, but I, I I think the book that we, we wrote the book that we set out to write and it is and it has ended up being pretty different than anything else that's out there because it really goes back in time. It starts in the 1980s with the invention of mortgage-backed securities or the modern invention of mortgage-backed securities uh, through the characters who were there at that time. It traces the growth of both subprime lending and of um, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac in Washington, D.C. It traces on Wall Street the growth of various um, means of measuring risk and other financial tools like credit default swaps. and it, traces the changing morality um, on Wall Street, and it really tells you the history of Countrywide. Um, so it's, it's, it's a different, and it ends right with the conservatorship of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac um, in the fall of 2008. So it's not a blow-by-blow -blow of, of the meltdown, it's rather a history of the events that led us up to the meltdown. 
told in, I hope, a character-driven narrative way. Um, that that It's a fascinating example of, of, I think, the power that one man has over, over a company and the the really untold story of how Merrill Lynch, once one of America's great companies, was brought to the brought to the brink of destruction, only saved by a last-minute merger, um, through really just the, the actions of a, a few people and 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 this chain of events that is almost just remarkable in, in hindsight, where this incredible exposure to these disastrous subprime mortgages accumulated on its ba balance sheet without Stan O'Neill, who was then the CEO of Merrill Lynch, even knowing that that was happening. He is, I think, still trying to recover from what happened at from what happened at Merrill Lynch. Um, you know, this this crisis. Although, I suppose I have over the years, as much as I say I've become more cynical, I've also developed, I guess, more more sympathy for the mistakes that 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 people make and the devastation that they suffer when they when they when they make those mistakes. And I think it's easy to look at a man like Stan O'Neill or a man like Angela Mozilla and say. You know, send them, send them to hell. Look at what they did to our economy. Look at the money they took out of their companies. But on another level, these were very proud men who believed in the companies they they created and will always be remembered as as failures because of because of what happened. And that, to them, I think is is worse than any prison sentence could be. <sighs> any evidence? Um, Getting to know people through the course of reporting a book, you come to see what what means the most to them, and the extent to which people are define themselves by their professional accomplishments and their pride in, in what they think they've they've built. So it comes down to a question of what you call suffering. To Americans who have lost their homes and are struggling to meet their bills in the wake of the financial crisis, no, these people aren't suffering. They're not suffering in terms of material wealth. If you think about your sense of the world and your faith in yourself being destroyed when you're 60, 65, 70 years old and having to look in the mirror with a very different reality than you you thought you were facing, I think I think that can be I think that can be can be devastating and I'm not I'm not saying it makes up for what for what for what they've for what people think they've done. I'm I'm not saying it's it's suitable suitable punishment. I'm just saying there there's there's a human level of pain there. Merrill Lynch was a huge company at its peak. It was one of the um, one of the the five big broker dealers on Wall Street, employing you know tens of thousands of people. It was the thundering herd. I mean, this was and it was an immensely proud company with a really long history and legacy. And all of that's that's gone. And Stan O'Neill was a man like 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 some in American business who really came came from nothing and beat back incredible prejudice and rose to be rose to be a really prominent African American CEO and and there's a there's a tragedy in his in his fall as much as I think when you read the book you see that that he brought it on himself well, he's really a, a risk manager who came to understand how bad uh, Merrill's exposure to the subprime mess was, and he had been sidelined um, under Stan O'Neill's Merrill Lynch, which is really how how this was able to take place, how Merrill Lynch was able to accumulate all of this junk on its balance sheet without anybody knowing. It was the slow sidelining of, of risk management, um, a critical function on Wall Street, but one which I think we've all discovered exists in name only at many firms, and it, over Stan O'Neill's tenure at Merrill, it was slowly dismantled and pushed aside in a way that O'Neill didn't even understand what, what he was doing. So this this story that we told at the beginning of the book is about this moment of realization that 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 doom that doom was was upon us. And it's to me a very a very human story, um, which is part of the reason why we wanted to start with it. You know, we can never. For most of this book, as in the Enron book, most people didn't want to be didn't want to be quoted. There's still enough. While the government has not brought very many, if any, well, a few criminal cases, there's still enough noise swirling around all this that people don't people don't want to be dragged into it. So the book is the book relies fairly heavily on anonymous sources. Sometimes quotes come from from third from third parties who 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 observed who observed the events and were in the rooms, and other other times they come from they come from people who. Are there. 
Let's see, people who refuse to talk to us. Well, one person who I would have loved to have spoken to, and he didn't so much refuse as was unable to talk to us, was Roland Arnall, who um, died in the spring of 2008. And he really, in many ways, was the, the, the pioneer, the founder of, of subprime lending, despite the fact that Mozilla was often given that honorific or, um, or, or extreme negative. Um, and Arnall is just a fascinating character. It stayed very, very private man, um, not a well known name because he never took any of his companies public um, and never was the CEO of, of any of his companies. Other people were always always the face the face person. And he became a huge political donor and was appointed the ambassador to the Netherlands by George Bush in, in, in 2004, just, uh, I'm sorry, 2006, when his company had, had just settled um, the largest predatory lending accusation by the attorney state attorney generals ever. And at the time, which is just astounding, no one paid attention to this. Wait, the once the largest subprime lender in the country just paid $325 million to settle accusations of predatory lending. Is something happening here we should all be aware of? And it rolled off. It rolled off all of us, I think. He died of um, esophageal cancer. It really started out of so-called hard money lending. So the practice of, say, you know, somebody buying a refrigerator and paying an exorbitant interest rate in order to, and you, it, the loans would be heavily collateralized, um, and this grew into second lien mortgage lending, where people would take out these, you know, really high interest rate second liens on their homes um, in order to basically pay for their daily expenses. And the hard money lenders were a small kind of tough bunch who really excelled in knowing their consumers consumer and getting enough collateral that they that they got their money back and with the slow liberalization of the laws surrounding the mortgage lending which we which we recount in the book and then the end of the SNLs um, and the well first the liberalization of the rules surrounding what SNLs could do and then the end of the SNLs you had a whole new breed of, of people start mortgage lending and it really took off in the 1990s um, and the thing that fed it in addition to this relaxation of the rules was the advent of securitization because in the past if if you were a lender, you would have to find somebody to finance your loans. And if you were a small fly-by-night lender, well, how did you get the cash to go out and make mortgages? So you had to quarrel together investors, and it was a slow, painstaking process. But with the advent of securitization, you could bundle up these loans, and you could sell them to Wall Street, which would sell them on to investors um, in the form of securities, which could get a really high rating from the credit rating agency by virtue of all these financial engineering techniques. And so the business just exploded. And you had this really what we like to call subprime one um, in the 1990s, which was the first wave of subprime lending and really ended badly. And it's just another shocking canary in the coal mine type example because people didn't pay any attention to the fact that this ended really badly once before. <laughs> You can if they go through Fannie and Freddie. Right now, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the two government-sponsored entities that were taken over by the government, are basically the only game in town. And so investors are unwilling to buy mortgages um, unless they have Fannie and Freddie's stamp on them, meaning that basically now they are explicitly backed by the full faith and credit of the of the United States government. Um, whereas in, in the, the so-called private market, which was these companies that would sell their loans directly to Wall Street, and they wouldn't have a government guarantee on them has been pretty much shut down in the wake of the crisis because it is such a difficult problem to answer. Um, Fannie and Freddie, uh, the government-sponsored enterprises, as they're known, became deeply embedded in our housing market. They are part of what's known as the secondary mortgage market, and it's this invisible part of the machinery of finance to most Americans, but a, but a very critical one. So Fannie and Freddie would buy mortgages that were made by mortgage makers, by originators, stamp them with their guarantee, meaning that nobody had to worry about the credit risk because Fannie and Freddie promised you'd be paid back and turn around and sell them to investors. And they became enormously controversial companies, enormously powerful, politically powerful and financially powerful, um, which the book traces, and enormously, enormously um, 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 just, just, just controversial. And uh, in the wake of this, you'd think when the government has to take them over and we're on the hook for untold billions of losses, uh, you'd think, obvious, shut them down, right? But without Fannie and Freddie today, we don't have a mortgage market because there are no private lenders who are out there willing to make loans. Fannie and Freddie and um, the FHA, the Federal Housing Administration, basically account for the mortgage market today. So you're in this conundrum of 
what what do you do? How do you yank these enterprises out from under the market when they are the market? It's you know it's interesting. They were always um, such an odd mixture of partly public, partly private, partly government-owned companies. They were huge forces on Wall Street, but they were located in Washington D.C. So they were always these strange breeds of companies. And now that they're owned by the government, in effect, they're even even stranger, basically, because they are run by their regulator, um, so run by the government, and. It's really hard to determine for what purpose they're they're being run. Are they being run to minimize taxpayers' losses and and make as much money as possible, or are they being run to support the housing market, possibly at the cost of, of to taxpayers? So it's 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 you're right. There's a shroud of secrecy over them now. The book focuses extensively on on Fannie Mae, so it's safe to say I talked to a lot of people who used to work there, but most of the old Fannie Mae people are are gone. When Fannie Mae was put into conservatorship, it had to fire its CEO, um, and and most of the top executives left. And that's you know, one thing Fannie Mae people will complain about. Well, Wall Street firms didn't have to fire their CEOs when they took the government help, government's help. You can argue that David Maxwell earned his money. He took what was a failing enterprise. It was on the verge of going broke when he stepped in and turned it into a phenomenally profitable enterprise. And one that I think during those years did decently manage these twin goals of being profitable while also supporting the housing market. But over time, and I blame the change in Wall Street culture a lot for this, Fannie got seduced, Fannie and Freddie, got seduced by the same enemy that so many corporations fall danger to, which fall prey to, which is just relentless profit growth at, at all costs. And if you're supposed to be a mission-oriented company that is supposed to have this other uh, reason for its existence beyond producing profits, that becomes becomes a pretty difficult conundrum over, over time. And the, the big fat gap in the title refers to a way that Fannie and Freddie made inordinate profits, which was taking advantage of their ability to borrow money at a very low rate, because investors assumed um, they were backed by the U.S. government, and buying mortgage-backed securities with that, and basically just earning the difference. And it was Alan Greenspan, who became a big foe of the GSEs, who uh, referred to that as the big fat gap. He took a company that was that that was Was the Washington Post had an article that said it was heading toward the biggest disaster in modern financial history, you know, going going broke at a phenomenal rate. It was run kind of like a government enterprise without a lot of focus on its on its on its bottom line at at, at all. Um, and it, like many of the SNLs, had bought mortgages um, and at a time of rising interest rates, and so was stuck with fixed rate mortgages paying one thing while its cost of funding was was going through through the roof. And so money was just going out the door every every single day, and Maxwell started to run it more more like a business. Um, demanded accountability on the part of on the part of managers. Um, changed some of Fannie's policies and procedures so that they no longer commit to buying a loan at any interest rate from from someone you know a year in advance and then be stuck with that loan even when it had turned out to be unprofitable. So you could you could argue that Maxwell set Fannie on the course of being a bottom line oriented company. But like everything in life there's there's a balancing act. I think it was a mixture. I th actually, I think the political connections were almost a deterrent at the time. Um, I was told a story about how some of the Republican board members were incredibly um, offended by Jim Johnson and didn't want him to to become the CEO of Fannie Mae. But he did have these these deep political connections, and I'm sure that David Maxwell was savvy enough to see how 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 important those would be to Fannie Mae in in the coming years, because Fannie was constantly fighting this battle with Wall Street and with others in the mortgage industry that wanted wanted some of its very lucrative turf. Um, but Johnson was also a businessman. He'd worked at, he'd worked at Sherson Lehman um, and had enough of a business background that that he he wasn't he wasn't a pure political operative. <laughs> he he was rumored to be a very, or regarded as a very very tough operator by the people who worked under him and by people who dealt with him, uh, a, a take no prisoners attitude, um, and some of that was bred into Fannie Mae's DNA. They always had the sense that people were trying to kill them off, and it was true. Fannie always had foes in in the government who who would have liked nothing better than to see the end of, of Fannie Mae, and so the company always felt that it was fighting for its very survival. And so over time that hardened into this into this very, very fierce take no prisoners approach to the world.
I think it is a testament to the low risk that everybody believed mortgages had. And in fairness, they probably did have that low a level of risk. What people at the time couldn't have foreseen were or didn't foresee were the changes in the mortgage market that made mortgages carry a much higher level of risk um, at the time, and the changes in Fannie's business that led it to carry far more leverage um, than it did than it did then. Oh, they did. People people tried desperately, particularly the Bush administration, to rein in Fannie and Freddie. Um, Alan Greenspan um, would would actually publicly say that their their portfolio, the amount of mortgages they held on their balance sheet, needed needed to be capped. And the very blunt answer is that Fannie and Freddie were simply too politically powerful for anybody to to do anything. Well. In a sense, that's too blunt an answer because people were also scared. People were scared as they are today. What happens if you take them out of the mortgage market? What happens if, if they're right and the housing market can't function without Fannie and Freddie? We'll get the blame. And so there was both, there was both a paralysis due to their political power and a paralysis due to fear. It really, the foundation is a part of why Fannie's lobbying apparatus was regarded as the most the most politically powerful, potent force that, that people that people have seen. I've got a quote in there from former Congressman Richard Baker saying, and you know, basically General Patton couldn't have couldn't have stood up to them. It was twenty four seven and you know never anything left a chance. And people talk about the sheer amount of money that Fannie and Freddie spent lobbying, but that pales in comparison to the other ways in which they, they, they bought influence, whether it was via the foundation or whether it was via these partnership offices that they opened all over, all over the country, um, or the revolving door, as you mentioned, that they, people went back and forth between Fannie Mae and, and, and Washington, D.C. Um, Tom Donilon, who will be uh, Barack Obama's new chief of staff, was, was once a high-ranking Fannie Mae executive. So the revolving door is, is, is nothing unique to Fannie. There's there there's an awful lot of that. Um, there there's an awful lot of that, and I think you can look at that through two prisms, and you can look at it through one prism in which you say, "How great! People make their money in the financial world, and then they come to the political world to share their wisdom and their insights into the real world with the rest of us. Um, how wonderful that these people, after making fortunes, are willing to give that up and devote time to public service." Um, you could look at that through a far l less benign lens and say that the ultimate form of corruption is not someone explicitly doing a favor, someone else a favor, but the form of corruption that happens when everybody already thinks the same way. And that if you have this revolving door, particularly between government and Wall Street, you're likely to get a lot of people who think the same way in positions of, of power. And and then you don't even you don't need explicit corruption you don't need any favors because you all already agree anyway it was it was preventable in the early years by the time 2005 2006 i think it would have been very difficult for one person stepping in to have taken an action that would have that would have prevented what was coming but so the crisis isn't a story of the crisis as, we, as we've told it isn't a story of big decisions made by big people. It's a story of corruption or venality or or wrongdoing at all at all or or invention simply simply gone wrong, pushed to a place they weren't they weren't meant to be taken at, at all at all layers. And so you had to have this this transformation of subprime lending. You had to have the mortgage um, become this product that it didn't, had never been in order to provide basically the, the raw material for the for the for the leverage that eventually took took the system down. You had to have this unwillingness to rein in the amount of debt that was that was in the system um, um, for, for it to become a problem and you had to have the invention of all these complicated financial tools on, on, on Wall Street. And so you had to have these, these disparate things kind of come together to make a, to make a crisis of the size that, that we had. So I think it was preventable in numerous ways or at least mitigatable, is that a word? In numerous ways um, along the way by by regulation or oversight of, of derivatives, by tighter regulation of investment banks, by smarter regulation of banks and investment banks, by some sort of action in the mortgage industry, given that was the shocking thing to me were the warnings from consumer activists starting in the in the 1990s about predatory lending and yet you didn't have the federal regulators do much of anything until 2006 when it was when it was far too late so 
so preventable, preventable, yes, but in the paths along the way, not in something someone could have stood up and shouted from the rooftops in 2006. I worked for two years as an um, analyst in the in the investment banking department in Goldman's mergers and acquisitions department, and then I spent a year working for what's known as the Whitehall Funds, which at the time was a Goldman fund that invested in distressed real estate. Mm. You know, I was very young when I worked there, and probably younger, um, younger in fact than I was in years. Um, I was a naive kid from a mining town in Minnesota who found herself working working on Wall Street. It was an eye-opening experience um, in terms of, I would say, how hard people worked and how motivated people were by by money, um, and those were, and that. That, that that stood out to me. I never saw, I came away from Goldman Sachs in my time there as an admirer of, of, of the firm. Um, I wouldn't say those were the easiest three years of my life. In fact, in some ways, I'd say they were the hardest, but I, but I felt like I grew up a lot and learned an immense amount by, by working there. And so I guess I have retained a level of loyalty um, to the place over the years. I think my view began to change. I did a, um, and I, and I was always an admirer of Goldman's success, too, and and of their, unlike other firms on Wall Street who merely talk about risk management, Goldman Sachs actually practices risk management. But there was always this underlying complaint about Goldman Sachs that you would hear whispered, nobody would ever say it on the record, but that the Goldman culture had turned rapacious, that it was profits at, at, any, at any cost, that this whole notion that their first business principle was our clients our clients come first was just completely, completely meaningless, that they would run over a client in the, in the, in the search in, in, in the search of enriching their own bottom line. And I, I listened to the complaints, but it was, and they were loud enough that it was hard to discount them. But it was also really hard to find any any proof that this that, that, that this was happening because nobody would go on the record and, and complain about Goldman. And to me, the, the really telling thing about the about the financial crisis was that it, it does show how how Goldman's culture had, had, had changed um, since the firm had become a, a public company. And it's really hard to look at their actions during the financial crisis and say that this is a company who believes that our, our clients come first, unless you very narrowly define the word client. I'm not sure I would put it exactly the same way that Frank Rich does, but I don't disagree with the, with the sentiments underlying that. It is indisputable that uh, really, sick, dare I say, byproduct of the financial crisis is that too big to fail firms have, have gotten bigger, that we bailed out the biggest institutions, which became even bigger and more powerful, and now we have even less diversity among, among financial institutions. Why not just break them up, make them into small firms so we don't, we don't even need to go through all, this legisla all these legislative contortions about how you, def make, a firm, how you make a firm fail? And, and I don't. I, I think it will be very difficult if we are faced with the failure of one of these firms to actually to actually let it fail. Um, and I think that the underlying issues of the financial crisis have not been fixed at all. And indeed, there's there's no easy fix. And they are. One thing is similar to what we talked about when we talked about Enron five years ago, and it's this culture of, of short-term greed. If I can get mine and get out, then who cares what happens after I'm gone? And that's an attitude that I think is pervasive across across Wall Street. There isn't a sense of a larger of a larger right right and wrong, and I I don't know how I don't know how you fix that. The other issue, to me, is that this this crisis. People want to phrase this as a crisis about home ownership. In other words, this was a crisis caused by putting people in homes that they, they couldn't afford. And it, it really wasn't. If you look at most subprime loans, they were used so that people could do cash out refinancings of their, of their homes. In other words, use their home like an ATM card because people aren't making enough money to support the lifestyles that both they and our economy has have gotten have gotten used to and that's a huge underlying problem that's not a quick fix about America's home ownership policy that's not that's not any kind of quick fix that's just a huge underlying problem and I don't I'm not sure what the fix is to that 
I think, unfortunately, that that's that that is that is mostly true. I would caveat it by saying that some of the banks who are engaged in the foreclosure mess today are not the same firms that were involved in peddling subprime mortgages, and it's easy to put everything under the rubric of of the financial industry. But in fact, it's quite a mass of of, of disparate actors. So it'd be nice to be able to hold Bank of America up and say, well, it owns Countrywide, therefore it's accountable for all of Countrywide's sins in the past. But if the executives and the people who ran Countrywide are no longer there, is it is 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 it is, is Bank of America really accountable? I mean, legally they are, but but you see what I'm go where I'm going since this is a since this is an ethical question. But I I do think it is it is the. Uh, for better or worse, the story of the financial crisis is a story also of trying to find the line between venality, greed, corruption, outright corruption, outright fraud, and most of it is somewhere in the murky middle. And as much as we may abhor certain behavior, it may not be criminal. And you can't, just because you are disgusted by behavior, you can't say it's criminal when it's, when it's not. And I don't believe that, that firms aren't being prosecuted because of some sort of political agenda not to prosecute them. The Southern District of New York is a very independent and, and powerful prosecutor. And if they were finding married examples of, of prosecutable fraud, they would, they would prosecute. You know, the countrywide case um, against Angelo Mozillo and a couple former executives settled on the eve of trial. And it settled because it was a civil case. And it settled because the case wasn't, wasn't ironclad. Um, and that's, that's a very tough thing to come to terms with because we as a country, we like our, we, we like our villains, you know, <laughs> makes us all feel better when we've suffered something as devastating as this to be able to hold up someone something and say, look, that, that, that's what's to blame. And when you ha have instead this, this murkiness, um, it's, it's, it makes the whole thing even, even harder to comprehend. Um, if you were going to bet with somebody, you were going to, you'd have to find a broker, but you could make a bet that Bethany's earnings were going to deteriorate dramatically in the wake of her book coming out, that this book is not going to be a success. And so you could buy an instrument um, that would pay you if I crash and burn. And that, 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 would be, that would be a credit default swap. Um, you'd have to find somebody who's willing to take the other side of the bet, who is going to say, no, Bethany McLean is going to excel. Um, and then you'd basically set up a contract between the two of you in which you'd agree on payments to be made um, and objective measures of, of my success or failure. You, you know, it didn't start out as gambling. Nothing on Wall Street ever does. So it started out as, as, as fairly legitimate. Say, I'm Bethany McLean. I might want to buy a credit default swap on myself, because then should I? crash and burn, I have protection. I have, I have something that pays me, that compensates me for my crashing and burning. So if you have a Wall Street firm that has made a loan to General Motors and has General Motors debt on its books, and they can buy an instrument that protects them should General Motors default, well, you, you can see that that's, that's, that's legitimate. But like everything on Wall Street, it, something that starts as a good idea gets taken to a speculative frenzy. And so credit default swaps eventually became a means of betting on the demise of companies that one had no connection to the underlying to the underlying debt and of structuring these just insanely complex investments based on mortgages. I think it's a complicated question. In the stock market, I am a fan of short sellers. Um, and what short sellers do is they basically are betting that the stock of a company is going to go down. And because they are making this bet, they do detailed, extensive research in order to uncover financial frauds, in order to uncover weakness um, in a company's accounting. And they do the sort of research that most people in the market don't do, because face it, we live in an economy where everybody wants things to go up. And that leads to frauds going unnoticed because most frauds, like Enron, take the compl complicity of the victim, and the victims are all too willing to be complicit because all of our money is in it, is in it as well. And I think short sellers provide an incredibly important um, leavening force ag against that. I, you really have to think think twice about that when it comes to mortgage mortgage backed securities. In an ideal world, the fact that there were people shorting the mortgage market would have set, sent a signal to everybody saying, "Wow, there are all these smart investors who who think this thing is going to crash and burn." But the market was opaque enough that nobody you couldn't see that the way you can can see it in the stock market. And because of the way these instruments work, you were basically not betting on real mortgages, but rather you were inventing on the casino version of a 
of a mortgage, so it ended up multiplying the exposure to, to mortgages, to souring mortgages that was out there, and multiplying the damage done, done by the by by the financial crisis. And I'm not sure. It's hard for me. It's hard for me to argue the social utility of it in the in the mortgage industry. Can you still buy sub? I don't think so. There may be a little bit. I've heard rumors of sub subprime lending coming back around the edges. So a subprime mortgage is basically a mortgage made to anybody with a low credit score. Anybody, it used to be anybody who didn't qualify for a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac mortgage, anybody who didn't qualify for a conventional mortgage. So you probably paid a higher interest rate. Your mortgage might have some special fees that applied to it. And it, the higher interest rate was supposed to be because you were a worse credit risk. But you could still get credit by getting, by getting a subprime mortgage. Um, and once again, in theory and in balance, that's that's a great idea. Do we, as a Fannie Mae executive said to me, do we want to live in a, in a in a country where because you have a blemish on your credit, you can never own a house? Well, no, probably not. These are the so-called credit rating agencies, and they are. Uh, to most people, they were a hidden but very powerful part of the financial um, of the machinery of the of the financial markets. They rate debt, so they're supposed to be able to tell you when debt is going to be paid back on time and in full. And a AAA rating, which the United States has, perhaps arguably today, but which the United States has, basically means that you're you're pretty assured of getting your of getting your money back. And AAAs were supposed to be handed out very sparingly. I think. Oh, I'm going to get the number wrong. We have it in the book, but less less than a dozen corporations um, warranted warranted a AAA rating. Um, um, and you know, the credit rating agencies are funny because they're this ability to rate debt makes them incredibly powerful because as a company you you can't sell debt without their sometimes without their their approval. I mean, they're but they're you know, they're they're staffed they're they're. They're they're not flashy like Wall Street firms. People there are kind of academic, kind of nerdy, kind of staid. They never made the salaries that people on Wall Street did. Um, so they were really kind of the little the little the little gremlins down in the basement making the making making the gears work. But with the advent of this thing called structured finance, which is making securities out of out of mortgages, they became incredibly even more powerful than than they were because the whole purpose of securitization was to take something that was risky a subprime mortgage and turn it into something that looked really safe. And in order to do that, you needed the stamp of approval of, of the credit rating agencies. And it was Moody's and S&P and Fitch who rated just mammoth portions of these uh, mortgage-backed securities with a AAA rating. They handed them out like candy. So this once pristine, um, um, really highly cherished rating really became quite degraded over the years. A lot of people in the end, changes in culture are often traced to, to one person and never fails to be remarkable to me the impact that one powerful person can have on the character of an organization, whether it's Stan O'Neill at Merrill Lynch um, or Brian Clarkson at Moody's. Many former people at Moody's point to him as the source of a, of a cultural change at Moody's. Moody's used to pride itself on basically we don't care what issuers, the investment banks, the companies whose bonds we rate, we don't care what you think. We're all about serving investors, the people who buy this debt. And if you, the issuers, don't like us despite the fact that you pay us, that's your problem. And under Brian Clarkson, the culture really began to change, where Moody's really began to care about what what the issuers um, thought. And they began to care about what the, the issuers, their investment banking clients, in the case of mortgage-backed securities, thought more than they did the investors who were buying these things at, at the end of the day. I don't think we're safer in any way. I have to agree with, with Frank Rich on that. Um, um, well. I think it's two separate issues. With all these complex financial products, I don't see why anybody in the world would want to own the stock of a financial company. There's just absolutely no way. If this crisis proved anything, it's that nobody on the outside can tell what's going on on the inside of these companies and that the balance sheets and financial statements of these companies may have absolutely nothing to do with, with reality. And I think that's really scary for our, for our system. Um, so that's one issue. And then on the second issue, as a consumer, can you trust the financial products that people that people are selling you? Can you trust the people who are selling you these things to do the right thing? 
Well, clearly the answer is no. And when you, one of the most stunning moments to me in, in the book was these internal Washington Mutual presentations showing how Washington Mutual tried to get customers who wanted a safe 30-year fixed rate mortgage to take out an option arm instead because Washington Mutual could turn around and sell that option arm for a higher profit to, to Wall Street. And it would be consumers saying, well, but I like paying off my mortgage every month and these things are dangerous and the Washington Mutual person coming up with ways to, ways to overcome those, those objections. You know, if, if uh, to me it's all in the marketing and the honesty of the marketing. If your real estate, uh, the person who was giving you a mortgage said to you, you know what, I'm not working in your best interest. I'm going to try you to, to get you to take the highest price product I possibly can because that's where my self-interest lies and look out for yourself. You know, I guess I'd be fine with it, but it's the hypocrisy that people pretend to be your, your friend and to be doing this in your financial best interest and they're, and, and they're not. I don't, I don't know. I obviously wasn't around 40 years ago, so I don't know if this mythology of America is mythology and if we were never really that way um, or if there's some truth to it. I do think, though, that part of it is the story of, of modernization and globalization and that the bigger a society we live in, the less people feel personally accountable. And the less people feel personally accountable, the more the more leeway there often is, there often is in, the, in their actions. And it's why I think the corporate world has to be structured in a way that incentives are all. People will do what they're paid to do. And, 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 it, and it, I'm not sure that that incentive structure has, has changed. I think it sold pretty well. Um, it was a strange book in that it sold really well over time. So it, it, I don't think it was ever, I don't think it ever made the top 10 on a bestseller list. Maybe, maybe it did, I'm not sure. But, um, but, it, but it sold consistently. I think more than that, but I'd have to ask my publisher. I think I think I you know there's always a little bit of ego involved in anything right of course you could say at the end of the day I wish it were I wish it were um, all the devils were here but Andrew's book is this cinematic amazing play by play of the of the events on Wall Street as it unfolded and I think that's an easier story to tell um, 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 on, in film than, than the book we wrote is and Andrew's book was done when HBO wanted to make its movie and, and our book was not done <laughs> so it's kind of hard to quibble when you don't have a, a, a when you don't have a manuscript to turn over to, to, to anyone and I think it'll be a great film. You really tried as much as you can to I talked a bunch to the screenwriter about about issues in the subprime lending industry about char characters um, people that I got to know during the course of the book that I might have in some insight into how they were being being portrayed for example Hank Paulson figures pretty prominently um, um, in the in the movie Too Big to Fail and Paulson's also a fairly prominent character in our book so so I have you know some insight hopefully into into how he works you know I think that's it's a very tough question because I think that I think that Paulson in retrospect it is very easy to poke holes in, in everything Paulson did I do not believe that he ever operated in a way that he thought wasn't in the best interest of the country. That doesn't mean what he did was in the best interest of the country, but I firmly believe that he thought it was. I also think that he stepped into a situation that was about ready to explode when he stepped in as, as Treasury Secretary. And so to put the weight of the financial crisis on him because he became the most visible, most visible force as it, as it exploded, um, I think, I think is, is unfair. I think you can ask questions about Paulson's role at Goldman Sachs and why, when he felt so strongly about certain issues, he didn't raise them more when he was the CEO of Wall Street's most, most prestigious firm. But to me, it's it's difficult to it's difficult to deeply criticize his actions as as Treasury Secretary. To put it a different way, I'm not sure I would want to replay those events with a different person as Treasury Secretary. I'm not sure I wouldn't, but I'm not sure I would. I think it's 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 a really tough question. I think that I think that you want somebody who is both knowledgeable and an independent thinker. And the second is very, very hard to find. Most people like to think like other people, and there's a sort of groupthink mentality that, that, that takes over. And when you do meet skeptics, like some of the ones profiled in our book, they're often a little bit out there. Whistleblowers are often kind of weird figures. Um, 
um, they're not they're they're not the sort of people who blend into a mainstream discussion because they're always saying, wait, what about this and and, and what about that? And I guess if I come away from this and the Enron story with one sort of pleading, it's that to, to listen to listen to the skeptics and to try to find people for those for those roles who have an ability to think independently. My husband, um, after leaving the government, went to a, a law firm where he um, where he does defense work now. So I. It's it's an interesting change in perspective, I I guess, and I think I understand a lot more clearly the issues between ethical wrongdoing and criminal wrongdoing, um, and some of the some of the other the other side of the story, that often when you have a very unsympathetic character it doesn't make its way into the into the public narrative. Um, and I think I have more appreciation for the complexities of the law.